So hello and welcome to the 2016 CSU Inspire. My name is Raya V. Hill and I am the Director of Diversity Education and Training to the Office of the Vice President for Diversity. And I have the honor today of being your host as we hear about the many inspiring programs and initiatives happening in relation to diversity, equity, and inclusion at CSU. This is our third CSU Inspire. Let me just get a, let me get some hands. Who's been to other ones? Yes. That's what I like. I love to see all these people here. Um, CSU Inspire has tremendously grown since its first inception, and it's actually become one of my absolute favorite events. I'm not biased because I'm actually emceeing it, but it truly is one of my favorite events. So the Diversity Symposium is just one of the many opportunities throughout the year that we provide for campus to engage in critical discourse, develop multicultural competency, and build recognition of the complexity of personal identity. If you would like to know more about our current initiatives and professional development opportunities, because we have many, please come and talk to me after the program. And you can see me. I'm the, I think I'm the only one in here wearing these bright red pants. Right? So you'll be able to see it. So come find me after, and we'll have an opportunity to chat more about it. So today, we are fortunate to have five presenters who have agreed to inspire us with their self-reflection, real-life experiences, and innovative research. Each presenter was asked to deliver this information in just eight minutes. As you can imagine, this is no small feat for professors and professionals who are used to, used to having more time and certainly more flexibility to communicate their messages. So each presenter has welcomed our challenge and we are excited and very grateful of that today. Our first presenter is Dr. Corey Wong. Dr. Corey Wong serves as a special assistant to the president and the director, and she's also the director of the Women and Gender Collaborative. Dr. Wong is also special instructor in the Center for Women's Studies and Gender Research. She earned a dual title PhD in philosophy and women's studies from the Pennsylvania State University after graduating summa cum laude with a BA in philosophy from Colorado State. Can I just say on a side note, and this is how great Colorado State is, that Corey and I actually had undergraduate classes together back in the day, and we've been able to come back and contribute um, what we've learned uh, to CSU. So with a passion for teaching, learning, and approaching education as a practice of freedom, Dr. Wong empowers others to think through everyday life experiences for personal transformation and greater social justice. So please help me welcome Dr. Corey Wong. During his 2012 fall address, President Tony Frank stated the charge to make CSU the best place for women to work and learn. This is an important and ambitious mission, and although we're not there yet, over the past several years there have been many demonstrations of institutional commitment to it. For one, the President's Women and Gender Initiative started, which in 2013 became known to campus as the Ripple Effect. And in that time, we also acquired a full-time vice president for diversity, a full-time director for the Center for Women's Studies and Gender Research, and Dr. Frank appointed a standing committee on the status of women faculty. These were in addition to pre-existing entities that were already on campus, including the President's Women and, and Gen the Commission on Women and Gender Equity, the Women and Gender Advocacy Center, and the Pride Resource Center. So if you're keeping count, that makes seven distinct offices, committees, and initiatives that in their own capacity do diversity and inclusion work with attention on women and gender. Each of them have their own area of focus, and they provide multiple channels for addressing needs that affect faculty, staff, and students across campus. They do this through policy recommendations, advocacy and outreach work, workshops and trainings, and academic programs of study. In 2015, I assumed leadership of the President's Women and Gender Initiative. And this was around the same time when President Frank encouraged campus to re-envision CSU, to reimagine and reinvent with a renewed sense of priority and commitment. So given the, the landscape of our campus in 2015, now with seven different entities doing gender-related work, the President's Women and Gender Initiative underwent its own reinvention and evolved from the ripple effect into the Women and Gender Collaborative, which launched this past spring in 2016. Through this evolution, those seven groups were named the core collaborators. And in order to coordinate and maximize our efforts, it became very clear that the Women and Gender Collaborative should impart, support, inform, and enhance their efforts 
and then fill in some gaps. So the collaborative is characterized by two phrases, educate to empower and engage to change. As far as education goes, the collaborative helps inform campus about what's happening at CSU and who's doing what. So for instance, there are the core collaborators, but there are also many other grassroots efforts like student organizations, task forces, professional development programs that are independent uh, on campus or happen within other departments and units. So thanks to the dedication of people who are just committed to these issues, across campus people host summits, retreats, speaker series, conferences, mentorship programs, and ongoing dialogues. There are even people who simply reserve space on a weekly basis so that women who are outnumbered by men in their discipline have a place where they can get together, connect, and build community with one another. So all of these contributions have an impact. And in fact, the Women and Gender Collaborative's grant program was designed to help seed and develop ideas just like these so that eventually they might become permanent fixtures across our university. My hope is that these sort of independent efforts will continue to grow as more and more people find ways to engage and do their part to help improve the culture around gender at CSU from within their own little pocket of campus. So as exciting as it is, and it's very exciting, you might be thinking to yourself, so why isn't CSU already the best place for women to work and learn? If President Frank were here, I think he'd probably make reference to the Cubs and note that in order for them to win, there needs to be a team of players in different positions, and it would be better if they practiced so that they play well, but before all of that, everyone needs to know the basic rules of the game. And if I knew more about music, I'd try to draw an analogy to a band where different people play different instruments in different parts, and it'd be way better if they practiced to become skilled musicians. But before all of that, in order for them to play as a band, they need to know what song they're playing together. And I'm just actually a person who likes to eat. So imagine instead a potluck dinner party. The best way for everyone to get fed is if everyone brings a dish. And it'd be way better if everyone brought their specialty dish so it's not just all chips and dip. But before all of that, people need to know some basic things, like the time and the place where we're all going to meet to eat. See, even with all the formal and informal, big and bigger efforts that are happening across campus from top to bottom, these will only go so far if we don't first understand where the problems are and why they continue to exist. Or said another way, one of the gaps the collaborative seeks to fill is centers on education by promoting a shared foundation of understanding about gender, period. So my sense is that most people are down for the cause to make CSU the best it can be because they often ask, what do I need to do? How can I help? But remember, you might as well just be the mascot or a big fan of the band or doing circles in the cul-de-sac if you don't first know the rules of baseball, the set list, or where the party's at. That's why it's educate to empower, then engage to change. Order and sequence matter here. Someone else recently asked for me to identify the gender issues at CSU. Is it pay equity? Is it interpersonal violence? Lactation facilities? What are the issues? And like so many others, he was humble and genuinely interested. But my response was that given that we're trying to change a culture here, the fact that so many people are just like him, wondering what the issues are, is itself one of our most pressing cultural issues. Because see, changing policies, benefits, and facilities at CSU, that's necessary work, but it won't be enough because we can think of these things as existing outside of ourselves. Some of us need them, some of us use them, but some of us don't. A culture, on the other hand, that's the stuff we live and breathe. We've been in it since before we were conscious, and we're always in it, even if we don't like it. Cultural realities that hold women back, that marginalize trans people, or put some people at greater risk of exclusion, isolation, discrimination, these aren't just issues at CSU. They're byproducts of gendered norms and expectations that inform all of our lives. At work, yes, but also at home, with our families, in our relationships, and even who we know ourselves to be individually. So in order to identify the gender-related issues at CSU, we need to first understand that they do not exist outside of ourselves, no matter who you are. Gender affects how each of us can and do move through the world and interact with others. It's something we all do, for better or worse, all day, every day, no matter who you are. And most of the time, we do it still pretty unconsciously. So if this is starting to feel a little abstract, don't be discouraged. It's not so lofty that you can't get it, it's actually just the opposite. It's so fundamental that you need to. So to this end, 
The Collaborative's website also features a growing collection of resources on topics like gender in the workplace, gender in higher ed, how to be a bystander and an ally, why intersectionality matters, and even resources specifically for men. Once we understand how gender operates in our culture, I'm hopeful that people will begin to see opportunities for them to engage. Microaggressions and subtle sexism will become more apparent. It'll be easier to spot gendered disparities and inequities, inappropriate behaviors or problematic assumptions in our policies, but also in our personnel. And then we can challenge and change them. Because we all do gender, we all have the responsibility to educate ourselves so that we can effectively engage in creating that change. So moving forward, please be curious. Get in the habit of learning and reading articles. Share them with your friends. Discuss them at meetings, even if that means putting a bullet point on the agenda. This is one of the most important and powerful ways that you can help make CSU the best place for all of us to work and learn. Thank you. That's a great example of why this has become one of my absolute favorite events, because we are doing so much on this campus. So much, but we also are so large, right? It's hard for us to know what one person is doing here if you exist on this side of campus. So I actually asked Corey to come and be able to share this information because I thought it's so important for people to understand how we are re-envisioning and we are growing and developing as a university and prioritizing gender and gender discrimination in different collaborative ways. And so thank you, Corey. Right on time, that was excellent. <laughs> So our next presenter is, do you notice I have to do this every time? So sorry, need a little box up here. Uh, so our next presenter is Dar uh, Dr. Eric Ishiwada. Eric is an associate professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies. His work focuses on immigrant and refugee integration in rural Colorado communities. We are very happy to have him here today and he's agreed to share his personal research with us in the next eight minutes. Help me welcome Dr. Eric Ishiwada. I'm gonna apologize in advance. I'm battling a bit of a cold and I'm not a really dynamic speaker to start with, but today's gonna be a little bit worse. So, and I might need more than eight for coughing breaks, but uh, I think I was invited to speak because of my outreach work uh, with the community of Fort Morgan, which is a small rural community in Eastern Colorado. And it's rapidly emerged as one of the most diverse municipalities in the state. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Morgan. Uh, total population is 11,407 residents, which makes it just the 41st largest municipality in the state. But 18% of the residents are foreign born, which is the second highest percentage in Colorado, following only uh, Aurora, but beating out like Denver and Commerce City. And 35.8% uh, of the households speak a language or languages other than English in the home, which is the highest percentage in the state. Um, and I also want to, to recognize that this transformation has been rapid. That in 1970, the U.S. Census found Fort Morgan to, have, to be 99.9% .9 white with uh, one African American. And that's not 1% African American, that was one African American woman. Um, right now, the ethnic breakdown of the community is about 50% white, 40% Latino, and 10% African. And uh, that's not African American. Th these are prim primarily East African people coming out of refugee situations, primarily from Somalia, but also, also Kenya, Eritrea, Ethiopia. Um, and these percentages look nothing like what we find in Fort Collins or Longmont or Boulder. Um, it's really only comparable to communities like Commerce City and Aurora. And when I told some uh, community partners in Fort Morgan that I was gonna uh, talk about diversity in Fort Collins, they, they laughed in my face and said, what's Fort Collins know about diversity? Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I want you to think about the type of resources that would exist for newcomer support, be they immigrants or refugees, in, in like the Metro Denver area. What type of programs exist? Uh, what type of support systems, and then think about what might be available in a somewhat isolated rural community on the Eastern Plains. And um, almost immediately, once we saw this demographic transformation, there were pressures on housing, law enforcement, 
social services, and education. And to be clear, like in the 90s, Fort Morgan was struggling with ELL education when it was just primarily Spanish speakers uh, coming from, from Mexico. But I want you to, I'm gonna ask you a question. How many languages and how many nationalities do you think are presently in Morgan County School District? Again, Eastern Colorado, an hour and a half east of here. How many languages and nationalities? So it's, uh, they have 20 nationalities and 27 languages. And so think about trying to be a school teacher that's uh, taking, talking to, uh, trying to communicate to parents who speak a, a dialect from Burma when you have nobody to help you out except for maybe the students themselves. Um, so what are the factors that led to this dramatic transformation? The prevailing explanations point to economic opportunities at the local meatpacking plant. And I think it's probably a little bit more complicated for, than that, but for today's time constraint, we'll just leave it there. Uh, Cargill Meat Solutions uh, currently has just a little bit over 2,000 employees. Uh, it's the largest employer in the county by a magnitude of four. About one-third of working-age people in Fort Morgan work at, uh, at Cargill Meat Solutions. And of those employees, 86% are either foreign-born or the children of foreign-born. And, uh, uh, you know, until, until 2006, the majority <laughs> of the employees were primarily Spanish-speaking from Latin America, but uh, after those notorious ice raids that occurred at the Swift plants uh, in December 6, 2006, uh, there was a ripple effect throughout the meat industry, and uh, the, the factories saw themselves in a, a really dramatic hole in terms of labor supply, and so they started to begin to actively recruit uh, refugees, with the logic being that everybody who enters the United States under refugee status is here legally. They have a de facto green card, and not all refugees, but a lot of refugees will come in with maybe limited English skills, maybe limited educational backgrounds, lack of professional training, so they might be willing to work in jobs that maybe U.S. born residents would find to be dangerous, dirty, or difficult. Um, the starting wage in Colorado, anybody know? Uh, or not, minimum wage, what's minimum wage in Colorado? 831. What do you think the starting wage is at Cargill right now if we went and you had zero experience? 1460 an hour. Uh, that means that uh, households that have two people that are working at Cargill are taking home about $56,000 a year. And this is really important for folks who have limited opportunities otherwise. And um, when I initially began working <laughs> in Fort Morgan, I probably had a really similar impression to the beef industry, as a lot of you might, that it's a big agribusiness and maybe they're taking advantage of vulnerable workers. But over the course of the last four years, I've had hundreds of conversations with the employees, with the workers themselves, and not a single one of them want to see the factory shut down. They might talk about a little bit slower chain speed or a little bit shorter work day or better communication with the supervisors, but they all recognize that this employment opportunity puts them in a unique position to really provide for not just their nuclear family, but the majority of the workers that are getting paid by Cargill spend, are, send about 50% of their monthly check abroad, either to uh, families overseas in Africa or Latin America or even relatives in other cities in the United States. So these workers are really the lifelines for entire, the economic lifelines for entire communities. Um, now this Economic opportunity is not to suggest that everything is fantastic in Fort Morgan. There are still four main challenges. It continues to be a deeply segregated community. Um, over the past couple years, there have been a couple of incidents, incidences of xenophobic hate crimes. Um, and uh, there is a considerable attainment gap for higher education for Morgan's Latino and African students. And then last, there was a really notable uh, workplace uh, dispute last December where 190 Muslim workers uh, went on strike and lost their jobs over to religious accommodations at the plant. And it's precisely within these four challenges where I've tried to support the residents in the community uh, in their community building efforts by acting as a bridge between the resources and the opportunities that exist at CSU and the needs that are articulated by the folks in Fort Morgan. And so last question, what do you think has been the most powerful, the most impactful resource that I've been able to bring from CSU to Fort Morgan? Students. 
More specifically, first-gen students who serve as mentors to college-bound high school students. Secondly, students coming from immigrant and refugee backgrounds themselves who can act as role models. And third, multilingual students who can help facilitate community conversations. So think about that. These characteristics, first gen, coming from immigrant or refugee backgrounds, having English as a second language. In some contexts, these qualities have been framed as obstacles or challenges to degree attainment but they have proven to be the single biggest gift that this institution has been able to provide the community of Fort Morgan. Uh, I'd also like to say that working in Fort Morgan has also, I think, to some degree helped the retainment of our own students um, when they are out in Fort Morgan. They get treated as rock stars. They're like celebrities. And people say, what, why? Why are these college students with so much going for them coming out to little Fort Morgan and it always kind of breaks my heart to a degree because when we're driving back home one of my students will say oh man I I learned more today than I did in my entire time at CSU and uh, I get it it's it's important powerful work but it kind of makes me wonder what are we doing so wrong in the classroom but whatever what are kids whatever all right so in sum, I feel really fortunate to be part of our students' engagement in Fort Morgan. It's been just a privilege to see everything that they've been able to accomplish and contribute. And I've been able to watch them grow into young professionals and witness them serve as, I think, really uh, proud ambassadors of CSU who actively honor that land-grant commitment of bridging uh, the academy with communities. Thank you. Sorry, you stole my notes, and I can't just make up bios. I needed them in front of me. Sorry, hang on a second. That was phenomenal. How many people knew that that was happening? Well, you all are great. <laughs> I didn't know that was happening um, until I had heard about it, and I think... You know, if you look at, look at all the research about high impact practices, what a great experience for our students to be able to engage with, with our community. What, what an impactful experience that is. Um, and nice lead in to uh, talking about our land grant mission and really our commitment to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Priscilla Gardea out of the Office of Admissions. Priscilla was born and raised in the border town of El Paso, Texas, and is a third-generation Mexican-American and first-generation college student. She holds a BA in English from Adams State University and a Master's of Science in Student Affairs and Higher Education from CSU. For over eight years, she has used her passion for equity and access to inform her role within admissions. She is committed to increasing access to higher education, in particular for underrepresented students. Priscilla is an assistant director in the Office of Admissions and oversees their inclusive recruitment. Please help me welcome Priscilla Gardea. All right. What I remember most uh, about my college graduation was how incredibly loud my large Mexican family was at the graduation ceremony. And it wasn't until after graduation, during grad school, that I found out why Mexican families and other minority families are so loud. Because it's a big deal. Because we don't go to college at the same rates as other folks. In fact, nationwide, students of color are less likely than their white counterparts to go to college. Limited income students are less likely than high income students. And first generation, college, first generation students are less likely than their non first generation counterparts. In Colorado, that achievement gap is one of the widest in the country. It's sometimes called the Colorado paradox or the ethnic achievement gap. Colorado, being one of the most educated populations and strongest economies, actually does a pretty weak job of educating its own students, especially its underrepresented students, which is why I've dedicated my life to increasing access and serving the students in Colorado. But lucky for me, I work at CSU, and every single day I get to live out and fulfill our land-grant mission. 
And we in the Office of Admissions take this charge very seriously. It truly serves as a compass for all that we do. As a land-grant school of Colorado, it is our mission to mirror the demographic breakdown of the state. So it's not just about the numbers, although that's an important part. It's about equity, it's about access, it's about doing the right thing. This is our moral imperative. So what does inclusive recruitment look like in the Office of Admissions? Well, I'm glad you asked. While we, as an office, do understand that it is the responsibility of all of us to recruit and outreach to diverse students, we actually have dedicated staff that specifically work in this area. And our approach is pretty simple. Be culturally minded, asset-based, intentionally inclusive of families and communities, and demystify the college-going process, which means cut the jargon, be real, and normalize the experience for students. We try to be as transparent as possible to address all the barriers students may be facing as they prepare to go to college. Here are some examples of what that philosophy looks like in real life. Last year, I was reading a student's essay, reviewing his application. And he started out his essay with a quote by Dolores Huerta. And it said, we have degrees so that we may serve those that don't have the privilege of having their own. He went on to write about how he was a first-generation undocumented student and how he wanted to get a college degree so that he can give back to his family and his community. Beautiful essay, strong academic student. So I called him up in the middle of reading his application. A little surprised, he answered. And I said, I just finished reading your essay. I loved it. We want you here at CSU. And I bet you it can be more affordable than you might think. Do you want to come to CSU? He said, yes. I said, great, here's what you're going to do. You're going to apply for the first generation scholarship. You're going to apply for the dream.us scholarship. Here's the information about your next steps for enrollment. And I'm going to send you an email with this information, so don't feel like you have to memorize it all. But I just want you to know that if you want to come to CSU, we can work together to make that happen. And that's exactly what happened. He started here successfully in the fall. We can also apply, apply these practices to small group experiences. In Colorado, most high schools host either a um, college fair or a high school visit from a college representative at their schools. For our target and partner high schools, we are also able to offer application days. And with enough prep and lead work, we can sometimes offer on-the-spot admissions decisions so students know right then and there that they can be admitted to CSU, that they are admitted. Then we come back in the spring with some of our campus partners and we visit with admitted students and I talk to them about their financial aid and the next steps about enrollment. They talk to somebody from the key communities and can apply to that program right then and there. And they also learn about the community for excellence. So by the end of the visit, they better understand their financial aid, they know that they're going to have support at CSU, and they can start seeing themselves at CSU. And for this population, that is huge. We've also been able to infuse inclusive recruitment practices into our large group events. Choose CSU is a conference-style program that happens in the spring for admitted students, where we invite them to come and learn more about CSU. With some thoughtfulness, we've been able to add sessions that might be of particular interest to this population. For example, a session, Tips and Tricks for First-Gen Parents and Families, a tour in Spanish, a bilingual parent panel, a session on how to finance your education if you don't have legal status in the United States, and a student panel, real talk, I'm a student of color at CSU. We've also been more intentional with making sure the students that need to hear this information are coming to these programs. So we've partnered with external organizations and invited them to come along with their students to the program and learn about this. Last year, Adams City High School, one of our alliance schools, actually brought a bus with admitted students and their families to come and see the campus. It is one thing to tell a student about going to college, it's a whole other thing to show them and to have their community and families be there as they experience that. And the efforts that we are making are working. 
Take, for example, the diversity rates of our incoming first-year students. In 2014, students, the percentage of students that identified as non-white was 20.5. In 2015, it was 21.5. This year's class is 24.5. That's almost twice what it was eight years ago. Yeah. And the best part of being intentionally inclusive is that just like the definition states, it is inclusive of everybody. So even students who don't identify as underrepresented are still benefiting from these practices. Yes, we've increased the number of diverse students, and we've increased the overall size of our incoming classes. This is the second year in a row that we've had record-breaking enrollment. So inclusive recruitment does benefit all of our students. And while these examples may be specific to admissions, there are three key takeaway pieces. One, we genuinely want these students here. Admissions believes in the work that we are doing, and that work has to come from the heart. Second, we're not doing it alone. Thanks to the countless partnerships and relationships that we have both internally and externally, we are able to create a stronger educational pipeline for our students. It really does take a village. And third, the number of underrepresented students that are coming to CSU is only going to go up. We are bringing them to this campus. They are coming. So now that we have brought them here, what are we doing as a campus? What are you doing to serve them better? Because ultimately, my goal isn't just to bring students here. My goal is to bring students have them retain and gr ultimately graduate so that one day it is their large families that are incredibly loud and proud during graduation. Thank you. Thank you. So much better about my large family that is very loud. Um, I loved it. One of the photos that she showed uh, showed uh, some younger kids when they came to visit. And I think what a great way to instill going to college is an actual dream that can be achieved. If you're going here when you are two, three, and four years old with your older sibling to see what we have to offer. And, and I love Priscilla that you left us with a charge because we can continue to grow as we are trying to do, and I applaud the admissions office for their intentional recruiting, but what are we gonna do with the students that are here? Right? We want to keep them here. We not only want them to, be, to stay and be retained, we want them to thrive and be successful. And so I think that is a great reminder for our campus, for our, our office, Office of the Vice President for Diversity, as well as all of us, to, con to continue to think about how can we best support all students, right? Because the rising tide, it brings up all ships, right? That's the right acronym, yes? Okay, thank you. I'm just like the worst with those, so thank you for that. I just threw it in last minute. Glad that it went over okay. <laughs> So our next presenter is Dr. Elizabeth Ryan. After volunteering with the Peace Corps in Nepal, Dr. Elizabeth Ryan found herself pondering her next steps. How could she advance herself in the sciences while still helping to address critical problems of the developing world? Through her outreach work in community forestry, food security and hygiene, she became aware of and committed to the challenges facing the third world nations and the need for new strategies to meet those challenges. Dr. Ryan is an assistant professor in toxicology. Her research explores the complex interactions of food components with gut microbiota and the immune system, and a lot of other words that I can't pronounce, and I'm really sorry, and I'm gonna to talk to you about it later. Dr. Ryan's global health research program also includes developing innovative solutions to food systems that will enhance food security. She holds joint appointments within the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition, the Colorado School of Public Health, and the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Help me welcome Dr. Elizabeth Ryan. Hello, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. So I'm very excited to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about and something I think every single person in this room has a relationship with food, right? Doesn't matter where you're from, what life stage you're at, or, I mean, and, and that relationship with food develops over time. It changes based on all kinds of experiences, and it requires lots of people because I think uh, feeding the planet is what I've heard people say, rocket science. There's no question about it. Um, it requires all sorts of disciplines. So, 
I don't have a lot of time to talk about sustainability and foods and global health all in one, but I think the goal here ultimately is how can we understand food better? How can we understand the problems? And so this brings us to what we think of as nutrition, is malnutrition is not just about not having enough food, it's also about maybe conditions that where there's excess nutrition and, and the problems of overweight and obesity, as well as um, you know, undernutrition and, and growth stunting, the majority of the world falls into these categories at this point in time. And the reason that I put up this information about both extremes is because at the bottom you'll see our GI tract, our guts, right? I mean, that, that relationship and how you feel when you eat um, is important. It's important if you're tired, it's important if you've eaten too much. One of the foods that we spend a lot of time with in my lab and do research on is rice. So I'm first generation from um, India, my parents were there, and I'm first born in my family, and rice is a staple food in our family in many, many countries in the world. But the thing is, if you look in many regions that grow rice, we also see a food security problem. We see diarrheal diseases being prevalent, and that's just a small picture there of showing you an example of during rice growing region, uh, season, what a typical toilet can look like. Um, everybody's experienced the problems of diarrheal disease. Everybody has, and it's not something I typically talk about at lunch, but um, it's important to understand. So we said, wait a minute, we need some solutions. It's not just about you know, improving hygiene and, and having more food. One of the things we thought was, let's look at the diversity that exists within a food within particularly within rice. So the word diversity I know is applied in so many ways in our cultures, but many cultures have different types of rice, and so I want us to think about that. The beauty is we um, started to look at this a little bit more, and that last fraction of rice down at the bottom, we all know white rice, we've heard about brown rice, but that bran at the bottom is a, a huge, one of the world's largest agricultural waste byproducts. It's still food, okay, but it's not being consumed. Another major food that our lab uh, focuses on and that a lot of research is devoted to is legumes, right? So everybody can look up there. There's over almost 15 different crops up there that provide a lot of the staple protein for the world. So this combination of being able to find foods that engage legumes, and I'm going to tell you right off the bat, you know, it's not just about rice and beans is, is a very easy statement to make, but there's a number of different foods and a number of different varieties that, that come into here. And the, and the evidence for the health benefits of these foods um, is so strong, so strong that it's become now this really large growing body of research. This is just meant to be a small table to show you that only 3% of all adults meet what we call the recommendation for dietary uh, legume consumption. And for whole grains, it's less than 1%. Okay, and this is data from the U.S. So it's not something that we're talking about in just developing countries or in other, in other parts of the world. Here locally, and in the U.S., we have um, a lot of work to do in terms of improving consumption of what I'll call very important fiber-rich foods that have evidence for health benefits. And this goes across demographics. Typically, what we see is as people um, become more affluent, less uh, legume cons uh, is consumed. Okay, now, we talk about being underweight, we talk about being overweight. Cancer is something every single person in this room has met somebody that's been affected by cancer. Okay, this number is growing very, very rapidly. Um, we know that there's a lot of dietary um, factors involved in the rate of cancer growth, and there's also a lot of room for us to utilize food in something everyone does every single day to prevent and control this disease. Okay, a lot of genetics and environmental factors play a role, um, but we've been quite committed to think about how we can better understand cancer. So if you go onto a website and you want to look, well, what can we do to prevent cancer? What is the information out there? There's no reason why across all demographics around the world we shouldn't be focusing on trying to hit at least these top 10 things. Okay? If you look at number four, it says eat more whole grains and legumes, and even beans are highlighted. So that's been exciting to think about that this information is actually fully publicly available. It's out there, um, but the research is still needing to be done because our behaviors and across, again, across communities, across the globe, um, we need to understand this. And, and we don't, but none of, we don't all eat here to prevent disease. I mean, that's not the concept. So, We've been trying to build partnerships. We want to eat for health and eat for enjoyment and eat for the you know, satisfaction that comes from it. So we've been building partnerships not just in research but also trying to um, in teaching and education. We've been outreaching and having partnerships with industry across this idea of studying very, very small molecules all the way to kind of global health implications and, and behaviors across the spectrum. 
Um, it's been an exciting journey. There's still lots of work to be done. The idea, though, is that these are foods available around the world. We have diverse um, types of these foods. We have populations that want to eat these foods. And then we think about the individual, right? So I'm, I'm telling you about large populations that we're interested in working in, but, but our inherent genetics is important. But this idea of the microbiome, right? So it's not just about plants and animals that we have relationships with when we think about our food, but we also have all sorts of microbes in our body that we're starting to learn about that come with our food, that come in our environment, that are in, inside us. And so this has been an active area of research, definitely something that's been making its way out there. Um, and ultimately, the environment we live in leads to the types of bodies that we create and we can move with. Here in Colorado, we've been having some very local efforts. We have a program called Healthy Hearts, which is just eight to 12 year old children that are all have been screened in schools and have high cholesterol. The point of these foods that we're studying have evidence for reducing cholesterol. Why not prevent the chance of these, girl, these kids going on statins by the time they're 16? Those studies have been done that it's safe for them, but we're thinking, wow, there's opportunities with just food alone to reduce their risk. We also have a trial in cancer survivors. We work with um, surgeons and different folks in the medical community here. We've actually had public health students even do kiosks about educating about whole grains and legumes in the grocery store, right at the point of purchase. So these are things we've done locally. Um, overseas, though, our idea is to focus on locally grown foods. You can just see some pictures of where rice bran is just piling up, and it's actually filled with nutritious components that protect against diarrheal disease and actually have opportunities to protect against a number of chronic diseases. So how can we start considering um, promoting these, making them available, and, and working locally with individuals who, with, at many, many levels, and not just with research trials, all the way to um, small business development and making it part of their food system. So our focus has been, you know, the food as medicine concept is, is not new, it's quite old actually, but the idea is it's not about health, it's not really about medicine and treating disease. In our context, we're talking about promoting health and just thinking about how do we promote a general increase in consumption of foods that we know have so much health benefit associated with them. So I'm happy to go into any more detail on, on all these levels. Um, it's been exciting here at CSU to engage folks all the way working in plant sciences and agriculture, all the way um, to public health students looking at population health and, and at very large levels. I think it's, it's been complicated, but it's also been very exciting um, opportunity and learned a lot every day, so and continuing to do so. All right, thank you for your time. That was power packed, and I appreciate it. That was so. That was so good. Now I feel bad that we served cookies with lunch. <laughs> we need to serve beans with it. No, I think I, I. I think that's great, and I love that because who food touches everyone. Right, and we all, and it, it touches cultures. You know, I grew up with my grandma in the kitchen making beans, and and that's a very cultural component of my life. And I would imagine that we all have those cultural components. And how do we incorporate food and tradition into health into practices? So thank you so much, Elizabeth. I would encourage um, any of you to come and talk to our presenters after our next presenter. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up our session, but feel free. They're going to stick around for a little bit longer. We build in time for you to be able to engage with them and ask questions and learn a little bit more. So our next presenter and our final presenter is Dr. Susana Munoz. Dr. Susana Munoz is an assistant professor of higher education in the School of Education at Colorado State University. Before accepting a faculty role at CSU, Dr. Munoz served as a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee in the Administrative Leadership Department. Her scholarly interests center on the experiences of underserved populations in higher education. Specifically, she focuses her research on issues of access, equity, and college persistence for undocumented Latinx students while employing perspectives such as Latino critical race theory, Chicana feminist epistemology, and college persistence theory to identify and deconstruct issues of power and inequities as experienced by these populations. She utilizes multiple research methods as mechanisms to examine these matters with the ultimate goal of informing immigration policy and higher education practices. Her first book, Identity, Social Activism, and the Pursuit of Higher Education, The Journey Stories of Undocumented and Unafraid Community Activists, highlights the lives of 13 activists who grapple with their legality as a salient identity. Please help me welcome Dr. Susana Munoz.
six years old, we came to the United States, and um, we, I was able to get my citizenship um, when I was 10 years old. Again, my mom came on a fiancé visa, and um, my stepfather is a citizen and um, from Iowa. That's important. But, um, but um, I never had to think about my legal status. You know, for those four years that I was in legal limbo, I never thought about my citizenship privilege. Um, and I was able to travel to see my family. The picture was of my cousins that you just saw. So for the last 10 years, I've been looking at the experiences of undocumented college students in, it, in higher education. And I've studied college persistence, identity development, social activism, and here's what I know. I know that undocumented students don't qualify for federal aid. So when you look at the price of college, they have to foot the entire bill. I know that our students come with a lot of anxiety and depression because somehow along the way, they've been made to feel ashamed of their legal status. And I know that our students continue to, to fear deportation, to fear deportation for their parents. And I also know that they don't know who to trust on a college campus with their legal status. So in 2013, Colorado passed the asset bill. And it, it was a 10-year fight, but we passed it. And all states have in-state tuition bills. Some st states don't. Some states don't have any bills. Colorado has an in-state tuition bill. And there's some states that restrict undocumented students from attending. So for Colorado, our statistics on when the bill was passed that we had 2,880 potential assets to register for the Colorado Opportunity Fund. And so 640 of the students did attend a college in Colorado. And every year we have about 1,663 undocumented students graduate from, from, from high school. So there's two things. There's an access issue. And time and time again, when I do my research, I hear, well, the counselors never told me I could go to college. They didn't provide me with any information. So here's what we're doing at CSU. We, we have a movement. We have a movement going. And this is a picture of Elias Quinones. There's other people like Ali Keller, Connie Lujan. Um, I'm blanking on people's names right now. <laughs> Wendy True. Uh, a slew of people that have um, devised Dream Zone training. So thus fall, the financial aid office, which is the most important office for undocumented students, went through a training, reviewed policies, reviewed practices, reviewed stories and research, and really got to understand and know about the plight of undocumented students on college campuses. To the extent that one student said, you know what, now I can go to anyone in that office. I don't have to only go through the designated person. I can go to anyone because of the training, because people understand. But there's still some issues that we have to work with. You know, we've passed the asset bill, we've opened the door, but have we welcomed them in is the question that I have. And our students continue to feel very isolated and silenced in our institutions. They don't see anything visible on our college campuses. You know, college is a place where we grapple with our identities. You know, that's a place where I found, you know, found my Latina identity in the cornfield. I did. And so we're not giving these students to really make meaning of the legality. And the students, like, that's the problem. For example, CSU, they're like, yeah, they have the ASA bill. You can come here, but we're not going to help you with anything. So there's not necessarily any of the, 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 the visible services available for our students. And that sends a message to our students that I need to keep hidden. I need to keep silent about my identity. And we, we have these um, beautiful principles of community that we, we've been talking a lot since I've gotten here at CSU about how we can be more inclusive and how we can practice social justice. And the question that I want you all to grapple with is, does those include undocumented college students? Are they included? Do they feel like they're part of, that they can be open about their identities? You know, are our policies and procedures, do they promote justice for our undocumented students. Because equity is not a buffet table. You don't get to pick and choose which ones you like. We're either about it or we're not. So that's something that I think as a community we really need to grapple with. And so I know you're asking, like, Susanna, what can I do? 
What is something that I can do? What are the steps that I can take? One of the things that you can do is talk about this issue to your departments and units. You know, not to be silent anymore. Educate ourselves about, you know, what does it mean to be undocumented in Colorado? How, how, how does an undocumented student live in Fort Collins without a social security number? Make resources available for students. Legal services is super important. Super important on college campuses. Hire individuals that are competent in this area. And be mindful of the language that we use. You know, do not use the word illegal. I know that's a word that's often used in our media by political politicians that we know, but that is a dehumanizing word. And so I stand before you as an unafraid educator with and for undocumented students. And so the question that I ask is, what are you going to do the next five minutes, the next five weeks, the five, five months, to make this campus more inclusive for undocumented students? I think a lot about the students that I research. The ones that shut down busy highways, the ones that infiltrate detention centers to unveil all these injustices happening in our detention centers. And they put it all on the line. And so for me to stand here with citizenship privilege, with the privilege of being in the academy, is that what is it that we have to fear? Nothing. So we need to take more risks to support our students and serve them. Thank you. Isn't a buffet. I think that's really actually pretty meaningful because if we really truly stand for this, we need to be inclusive of all injustice, right? We need to be mindful of it. And so thank you for that. So I want to thank our presenters. I know it's not easy to do that. Even for the most skilled uh, uh, public speaker, it is not easy to do that. And so I appreciate you all coming out and doing that and sharing your information and your research. They accepted the eight minute challenge and we are eternally grateful. I hope you're leaving as I am today, inspired and looking forward to more diversity and inclusion initiatives and dialogues on campus. I encourage you again to stay and to meet our presenters, and I also encourage you to attend the diversity symposium the rest of the day, as well as tomorrow. We have a full schedule tomorrow from 8 until 3.30 of sessions that are available to you. And on behalf of the Vice President for Diversity, and our office, and our division of four people, I would like to thank you for coming. And then also, uh, we're going to turn the house lights back on. There are some evaluations on your table. If you can just uh, spend a few minutes filling out the evaluations. We do have pens. We can send more pens around. But if you would just leave them on your table, we can gather them because we want to make sure that we're listening to your voice as we create this event. We will also, because we get this question previously, I will also check in with the presenters to see if they are able to share their slides. And we will look to post them on our website. So if that is a question that you have, we, I'm all over it. I'm going to make sure that it happens. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>